So welcome everyone. Um, today's topic is opportunities in the midst of um, COVID-19 pandemic uh, by Gary Davidson from Castle Law. Uh, he's been a long time uh, preferred partner uh, for the past two years. Not only that, but Castle Law is number one law firm in Illinois transaction wise. So Gary, thank you for joining us today. We're so happy to have you and looking forward to everything that you have to share with us today. Hugo, those, thanks so much for having me. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I was having a little bit of trouble with that link, um, but I'm on now. Um, are, are the participants able to see me or am I just talking? We can see you great. Oh, okay, awesome. So uh, guys, um, I want you to think about what Warren Buffett talks about uh, when we talk about uh, shifts in the marketplace. And I've been uh, a practicing real estate attorney in Illinois now for approximately 25 years. I've seen uh, two, three, four shifts, uh, both mini shifts and major shifts in the marketplace. What's different about COVID-19 is that there were not economic factors that caused a recession, which caused a major shift in the real estate industry. This is a result of a health pandemic. And so our economy reacted to the health pandemic rather than the economy leading other things and causing other, uh, other things to flow from that. Because if you all remember back in February, consumer confidence in the United States was at an all time high. Our economy had the lowest unemployment rate in the history and things were moving along very, 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 very well. Now I happen to rep represent a lot of hedge funds, a lot of private equity groups, a lot of high net worth individuals. Most of the investors in the Chicagoland area that are uh, institutional, uh, the largest investor in the Chicagoland area by the name of uh, Apex National Real Estate that's buying between 10 and 20 assets per month are clients of mine. I say that not to um, make a statement of braggadocio, but I say that because I have a very good cross section that I can provide you with that inside edge so that you know what you should be doing right now in the real estate industry. So what I can tell you, Hugo, is interestingly enough, most of the large institutional buyers, Apex National Real Estate uh, being no exception, are continuing to buy in this downswing. Many people, and again, Everybody has an opinion. I can prognosticate on what's going to occur one month, two months. If, if I could actually make a prediction with a total specificity and tell everyone this is exactly what's going to occur, I wouldn't be on this webinar right now. I'd probably be down somewhere in Mexico with Hugo relaxing, drinking a margarita because I would have all of the answers and I, I could sell that off and make hundreds of millions of dollars. But what I can tell you is that the largest institutional buyers, the largest uh, private equity groups, those people whom I say are a heck of a lot smarter than regular Joe average people like you and I are still actively participating in real estate. Because again, what do people like Warren Buffett say when things are starting to depress, that's where the opportunity are, where the opportunity is. Hugo, there's been a massive, um, every time there's a shift, there's what we call a massing, massive culling of the herd. If you guys have heard of the term culling of the herd, that means that over the last three or four years, five years, it's been extremely easy to buy real estate. In the Chicagoland market, we used to six, seven, eight years ago, have one, two, maybe three uh, hard money lenders. Right before this occurred, there was everybody in the Chicagoland market that was attempting to loan money to investors. So money was easy to get. The burst strategy, 
buy rehab refinance was extremely easy. Investors were over leveraging. So in other words, greed causes problems. And so when we over leverage and we don't have those reserves, what happens? Markets um, get saturated and those people are going to be culled because they don't have that carry. Many investors walking into this, you know, had not even a month worth of reserves. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunities. What we don't know and what I believe is going to occur is that we're going to have what um, we used to in the old days. I don't know if it's a politically correct term now, but we're going to have what we refer to as an Indian summer. An Indian summer, for those who don't aren't familiar with that, is in October, November, where we might have that one week or 10 day period of last good blast of nice good weather before winter comes. How you doing? Tell your mother hello. Uh, situation is we're going to have an economic rebound because both the Republicans and Democrats came together. They um, put a lot of money, trillions of dollars into the U.S. economy to bolster businesses. My business was no exception. We received a large PPP fund and we were able to bring back our employees. And all economic indicators are that we're going to have a rebound. Now, long term, whether inflation and a recession kicks in, um, that is yet to be seen. But right now, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity. And to bolster that opinion, we're still seeing um, lots of activity in the, in the um, what I'll call traditional or retail sector of the real estate market. And what I mean by the traditional or retail sector is Joe and Mary Smith that are buying a property. Frank Montreux, a good friend of mine, number one realtor uh, for investors in the Chicagoland area, his numbers haven't really changed since the beginning of this COVID because people are still buying properties. Um, so Hugo, it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. I know a lot of the gurus, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people are, are insulating, but the best, most sophisticated people go against the grain. So if every single person that's an investor right now is not buying, what do you think it is a good time to do? Now, remember, if, if I tell you guys, hey, there's a pond down the street and it's got the best fishing in the world and that gets announced on Facebook and there's a fisherman fishing every foot, right? There's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure on that pond. But when, when the opportunity strikes is when you find that pond and no one's fishing it. And right now, you know, no one, uh, all of the investors are scared. And a lot of people are not fishing at that pond. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of people who are looking to sell, who are still in distressed situations. And that's where this unique product, Chicago Deal Vault, this, guys, I don't know if you realize this, but this product doesn't exist. You know, I'm not a, uh, by the way, you know, Hugo, Hugo recommends me, but I'm not a, uh, 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 a paid advertiser here. I know this stuff and this does not, this type of thing doesn't exist. So what's the pressure on the inventory with Chicago Deal Vault right now? What's the pressure on the assets that Ryan Smith is selling, the largest REO broker? Yes, there's still a ton of subscribers to Deal Vault, but there's not as much pressure on those resources. Go back a month or a month and a half ago. How many times 
did you go on to one of these Facebook pages? You, you saw a home master franchisee send out a property and you showed up at the property in Lansing only to see 35 other people there in front of you waiting to get into that property. Have you tried to do that last week? Have you tried to do that for the last two weeks? Guess what, guys? There's not 35 people at that property. There's one. There's two. What kind of opportunities do you think that provides for you? That's called getting the edge in real estate. Okay? Now, I can only speak, and in, in, in Hugo, I, we didn't talk in advance about the format. I don't want this to be a monologue. I don't know if people are going to submit questions. If you have questions for me, here's what I can tell you. These hedge funds that I represent, these private equity groups, groups, these international funds, I just got a new fund in from Israel that's going to be buying condos in the city of Chicago. Because, because, of, this, um, because of this uncertainty, this is not a localized issue. This is not just Chicago. This is not the United States. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty worldwide. And when you get into con in developing countries, the fill, you know, you go over to Indonesia, Vietnam, those, play those people who have assets are trying to move those assets out of their country and invest in what still is the greatest investment in the world, which is soil in the United States, because we have the greatest economy and we have the greatest stability. Um, so so you, um, I can continue to go on. I can take a couple minutes to, to, to you know, kind of hear your observations, um, answer questions. I, I've got more content. Certainly I can go through. Uh, how do you want to handle it? Um, you know, the way you are presenting, that's awesome. And then uh, we can take questions as they come along from members. So they can okay, and I just yeah, and I just popped up the Zoom group uh, group chat, and um, so as I'm kind of talking here, um, I'll um, start to answer questions. My good friend John uh, Slurus uh, has a question about how how the virus has helped or hurt the mortgage uh, market. Um, the The coronavirus has um, dramatically impacted the mortgage industry. Um, there in the Chicagoland area, um, many, many of the hard money lenders have completely um, moved out and are not going to lend uh, for the time being. There's a few uh, that are still available. If uh, people are watching, Hugo can send you my contact information. I know that about three or four lenders that are still lending. But the other thing that, that, that uh, uh, they've done, John, and this is not going to change. This is going to be the new norm. Um, this idea of 10% uh, down uh, on the acquisition, 100% rehab, um, that's gone. Lenders are going to require more skin in the game. So what does skin in the game mean for those of you who may not know the industry vernacular? That's your cash in the transaction because they're fearful. They want to make sure that you have sufficient cash in the transaction such that if they have to take the property back uh, in a foreclosure, there is sufficient ham on the bone, a sufficient amount of equity position that the lender won't get hurt because lenders are not in the business of losing money. The good news with lenders is they don't want a split of your property, but they definitely want the interest and they don't want to take that property back. So the lending industry has tightened up significantly. I don't foresee that changing going forward for quite some time. Um, it loosened up more and more and more as lenders com competed. But just like with investors, the herd has been called with respect to investment real estate uh, for mortgage brokers and for lenders. So fewer parties lending, 
the fewer the parties, the more onerous the terms on investors. The good news for those of you who have themselves a um, cash position uh, or who can line yourself up with these lenders who I can recommend to you, uh, you will be in a position to take advantage of this shift in the market and get that edge that we're looking for. Because again, real estate is about getting an edge. Real estate is the least novel concept in the world to invest in. What do I mean by that? Everybody who has had two cents to rub together has considered investing in real estate. Yet, for those of us who build relationships, strategic relationships with great products like Chicago Deal Vault, aligning yourself with the top people in the industry, like my good friend, Frank Montro, or my good friend, Ryan Smith, the uh, largest REO broker. Who do we refer our business to? Who do we, who do people call first? Their friends and their relationships. So Ryan, when he has a property, he knows that I've got the most investors. So he's going to call somebody like me or somebody like Hugo so that we can get that out to the people who we have relationships with so that you get the edge. Uh, Kevin asks, um, essentially the real estate equivalent of dollar cost averaging continuing to invest similar no matter what the market conditions are. Okay, it basically is, is he's just summarizing what, uh, uh, what I said. So, and Kevin, um, you know, again, I'm gonna use Apex National Real Estate because they're still actively, actively buying. The guy who is the principal of that if you Google his name, his name is Mark Filler. Uh, Mark owned Prospect Mortgage. He sold Prospect Mortgage to um, Jordan Capital Finance. Jordan Capital Finance then sold to Finance Company of America. Most of you are probably familiar with Finance Company of America. Finance Company of America is the Blackstone Group. What is the Blackstone Group? Blackstone Group is the largest, the largest hedge fund for buying and selling real estate. So these people, direct connections that Hugo and I have to the people who are top in the industry. These guys are guys that graduated from MIT, Harvard, the Citadel. I graduated from Northern Illinois University, okay? These guys are smart. They know, they've got, they've got relationships with the you know, chairman of the uh, house, uh, Foreign Services Committee, things like this. I mean, it's amazing the kind of relationships. And then they give us the edge and we kind of, it just trickles down. Um, okay, uh, Lisa and John uh, are asking, how are you seeing the back end refi market? Um, back end refi market is really, really, really tough right now. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna lie to you. It is, it, it's, it's tough. Again, terms are gonna get more onerous. Uh, the vetting process is going to become uh, more arduous. Uh, they're not going to, um, the, you know, one of the things that I want to point out is um, we were starting to see a gravitation toward um, loaning on the asset. Okay. Does everyone understand what loaning on the asset versus loaning on the person is? One is the collateral is simply the asset and it doesn't matter who the individual is, they are loaning only on the asset. Well, loaning on the asset's a great thing as long as you have confidence in the real estate market and you're seeing a trend upward in values. But what happens if Gary's wrong? What happens if there isn't this Indian summer? What happens if the, um, the reckless spending of our federal government sends us into a tailspin because of massive inflation and then a recession hits. Well, loaning on an asset at that point, if the housing market starts to go in a downward pattern is no good for lenders. They want to make sure that the borrower has the capacity to pay that loan back irrespective 
of the value of the property. And oh, by the way, think about this for a second. Now, buying fix and flips, that is a little bit more speculative right now, right? Because we, you know, I'm, I'm saying I think we're going to hit an Indian summer, but yet I'm saying I'm not sure what's going to happen after that. So I'm basically saying there's going to be a window of opportunity where the uh, real estate market spikes, but we may have a spike and then we may have a, a, a downturn. Um, we don't know. Um, so fix and flips a little bit dangerous because are you going to hit that window, right? Rentals, much, much easier to analyze, right? Actually, if you think about it, rentals may very be a very, very good investment right now because you can actually run your numbers. You know what things are going to run at, especially if you're going to do um, Section 8 rentals, right? Section 8, again, I want to dumb this down. I hate to talk under or over anyone. So if I'm talking under you, I apologize, but there's people on the call that probably don't understand what Section 8 is. Section 8 is subsidized rent from the government. Why do people like to buy in Lansing, South Holland, Dalton, Calumet City? Because those zones are very, very high rental rates. And that's not going anywhere. So you can run your numbers. Doesn't matter what the economy is doing. If you're intending on holding your rental asset to create that life worth living, that legacy worth leaving, and that business worth owning, if you're intending on holding that for the long term, it's just like investing in our 401k or stock market, guys. I lost, I don't know, a half a million, maybe more in the stock market uh, in the last couple of weeks. Or, well, I haven't looked at it because it's too depressing, but there was a period of time where I lost a ton of money. I think it's, it's starting to rebound. But I'm 46. I'm not worried about cashing in that money. You know, hopefully in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whenever I get to the point where I'm going to start drawing on it, things are going to be good because I know that the stock market performs at an average of six, seven, eight percent on an annualized return, right? So I, you don't look at it in terms of volume. Everybody has blinders on and they look at, oh my God, and they overreact. And that's where guys like Warren Buffett comes in. So this, the rental properties are actually really good right now because again, everybody's saying, oh my gosh, don't buy. Well, guess what? The pond is is still got fish in it and nobody's fishing at it. So that allows you to get those better properties and they're still performing at the exact same rate. Now, am I oversimplifying things? Am I forgetting to tell you about Governor Pritzker's moratorium on evictions? Am I, am I talking, you know, am I telling you that, um, you know, perhaps people are going to be less likely to pay rent? Obviously, in a one hour webinar, I, you know, I'm giving you 10,000 foot things. Yet, if people are, if we're at 20% unemployment and the economy's not going to recover, where do you want your money? People are going to lose their homes. Everyone has to live somewhere. And so buying rental properties, when people are losing their properties, is an opportunity to house people. And I want you to think about another thing, um, which again, I'm gonna be on my soapbox here, um, but I feel very, very passionately about this. It's part of my core belief. Too often in real estate, we feel as though we have to be a predator. We have to take advantage of people. We have to, um, you know, beat everybody down to the last penny, and it's me versus you. Guys, if you want to be successful in business, I want you to read a book called The Go-Giver because it's about creating opportunities on both sides, win-win. And when you're providing people with opportunities that they didn't otherwise have, installment sale contracts, where someone lost their house because of 
because of a, a tragedy in the economy, but yet you're going to be able to sell them that house on an installment sale contract, articles of agreement for deed, contract for deed, all those terms are used interchangeably. You're giving a person an opportunity to start over. Deceit, lying, being at the kitchen table and telling people mistruths is the number one fallacy in investment real estate. It's the number one fallacy on Facebook. It's the number one fallacy by gurus. It's the number one fallacy. Because if you operate in a, in, with integrity, with honesty, you can, you can provide people with so much and benefit as well. There's no reason that you can't be at the kitchen table when you're putting your bandit signs up and say, you know what? I buy a lot of houses, but sometimes, sometimes I can't buy every house I see. And, you know, if I find a buyer for you um, that's going to pay the exact same price that I'm offering you today, um, is that going to be okay with you? That's different than the, hey, I'm going to buy your house cash and I'm going to close in 30 days. I'm talking to you wholesalers. When you say that to somebody and you know that's not true, and this is that person's last chance. It's their last opportunity. They have children in that school district. They're looking at losing their house. This is a heavy burden that we have. And there's an opportunity to do things both well and honestly and the right way. Okay. So again, that's just my soapbox. I just think that if you do that and you operate with in that fashion, you're going to be far, far more successful. When you're working with your business partners, your contractors, your home inspectors, your attorneys. Obviously, our margins in this industry are slim. Obviously, we're not looking to overpay. However, if you're working with um, your uh, key business relationships, okay, somebody like me, for example, and you're squawking and complaining over $50. I represent hundreds of investors. I have the opportunity to put properties in front of you where you're going to make 20, 30, $40,000. And you're sitting there ruining a relationship over $20. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Because then I just call somebody else with that opportunity. You don't hear about it. You, you thought you won because you saved $20, but you didn't win. Because guess what? The next time I got the phone call, I'm like, look, it's much easier for me to send it to John. John's willing to pay me $600. He doesn't ask for 550. So do that with all your clients because your contractors are gonna win, win, win you over. Get a good deal, but don't beat people up. Um, okay, seeing the back end refi market, Trudis Cab, can you speak? Okay, uh, can you speak to risk of not being able to refi once you buy rehab of the burr. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Lisa and John, that's, I think I answered that question. It's, it's definitely, if you're not, uh, if you're simply refinancing based on the asset and based on, not based on your own personal um, uh, uh, financial condition, um, that is a um, slight risk. That is, um, you know, a situation where you may need to keep more money in that property. Um, but again, um, you know, we all want to scale up very, very, very quickly. Um, but the point is, one of the things that um, gets glossed over by a lot of people is you have to have your carrying capacity. Because if you get too top heavy, what happens when you stack, stack blocks way up? Uh, when you stack blocks way up, the blocks fall over. So don't get too top heavy. You need to have a firm base and that is creating those two, three, four months of reserves. If that means you own two or three properties, rather than six properties, um, Alicia, you're gonna have to turn your uh, volume off. Um, okay, so Jeff, uh, what's your thoughts on these tenants' rights groups trying to rent, trying for rent forbearance? How successful will they be? 
Okay. Well, um, I get that question a lot, um, and it's hard not to get political when I get questions like this. The state we live in is occupied territory for Mike Madigan and the Democratic machine in Chicago. Their constituency, where they receive their votes, are those people who are going to be the beneficiary of tenants' rights. So um, they're going to be successful in Illinois because it's all about political power. And the political power in the state of Illinois currently resides with um, the Democratic Party. Now, again, regardless of your political beliefs, that's just the facts. Um, so um, I think that um, they're going to be successful. Um, I think that it has to do with winning elections. I think it has to do with power. Um, and at the end of the day, all of us vote with our own specific um, personal interests. And the more people who are beholden on the government for how their uh, primary income is derived, that, that is a self-fulfilling constituency that is going to continue to vote for those programs. And that's how people maintain political power. So um, sorry to offend anybody who uh, uh, is offended, but that's, since you asked the question, that's my opinion. And um, I'm sure that a lot of people will disagree with it. Uh, can we expect price coming down in the near future? Um, yes, uh, I do believe that um, uh, the, uh, there will be um, some sort of a correction Obviously, if we look back to 1900, every 10 years, there has been a correction in the market. We're way overdue for a correction, okay? Way overdue. Um, so there is going to be some sort of correction. Now, um, does, again, that seems to be inconsistent with my opinion of now's the time to buy. And I don't think it is. Uh, because um, you can't wait for the lowest point to build your portfolio. Again, when I'm talking about rentals, if the numbers work now, they're going to work later. So you should always be looking for opportunities. The problem with most investors, attorneys, and everyone else in the world, is we want a step-by-step approach, a step-by-step -step process. We want, we, want, um, we want to paint with bright choices. This is how politicians do it. If you vote for me, the world will be great. If you vote for him, the world will be terrible. The reality is whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump win this election, America will continue to be the greatest country in the world, despite what people say, regardless who wins, right? And that's the same thing with real estate. Um, there's, there's always going to be opportunity um, to build your portfolio as long as you run your numbers and that asset is performing. But we, all too often, we want to say, you know, is this the contract I use? Or is that the contract I use? What's the step-by-step -step process? And if, if investing in real estate were simply that easy, then everybody could be successful at it. But I want you to think about not what's that universal tool, but rather building a big tool belt so that whenever you in, uh, are, uh, encounter a particular situation, you know which tool to use in order for you to have a successful outcome. That's why you're, that's why you're more successful than other people, because on Mother's Day, you're li listening to me yap rather than um, you know, spending time with your family because you're committed to your success. Now, just remember, whenever you encounter something, you just need to have a specific tool. A lot of times people go into something, they say, gee, there's, there's no opportunity here. This prop, 
person doesn't have equity. Again, you heard me talk about the term contract for deed. A property that doesn't have equity is a perfect uh, property to buy on contract. You don't have to uh, have equity to, to handle that asset. So sometimes people will just say, yeah, that property is no good. The reality is it's a good property. It's just not good for what you're trying to do with it, right? Everybody can understand sometimes properties are good rentals. Sometimes they're good flips. Sometimes they're good to buy on assignment. Sometimes they're good to wholesale. So just, just you, every time you learn something, that's just adding a tool to your tool belt. Um, uh, right now, everything is still overpriced uh, with a question mark. I don't think that that is actually uh, true. Um, I mean, actually, anecdotally, um, I had a client that uh, closed on a property on Friday um, and sold it the exact same day, guys. He made a $68,000 profit. 68000 If you don't believe me, call Michelle in my office. She was, she did the closing. She's the paralegal. You know, and she was very happy for the client, but she was also bummed out because she's like, this guy just made more money than I make in a year. <laughs> um, 68000 So that property was purchased after February during this whole situation. Because again, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to name groups or organizations, but um, you know, different investment groups I um, am affiliated with, you know, in the last two and a half months, I've had 75, 80, maybe a hundred canceled contracts. Okay. That's fine. I'm not, um, I'm not uh, uh, maligning the person who canceled those contracts. That was a good decision. But what does that do to the market? It creates opportunity. These, these asset managers are staring at a massive amount of foreclosures coming down the pipeline. The last thing they want is to have more assets on their books, right? So now you've got this huge influx of properties that are coming back on the market that are wounded ducks because they've been listed they've, and the contracts have now been canceled. And all these properties are getting there. What do you think these banks and asset managers are doing? They're freaking out just like you. So guess what? My smart investors, the best investors, the hedge funds, the guys that went to MIT, they're buying them. Um, uh, okay, institutions still buying multifamily in Illinois. Um, not a lot of institutional investors buying multifamily right now, actually. Um, multifamily's um, still extremely competitive, very, very difficult to find. Uh, if anybody's looking for a 12 unit building uh, on the near east side of uh, Joliet, it's Cass and Collins. If anybody is familiar with uh, Joliet, Cass and Collins is what I refer to as um, Little Mexico. And it's, um, it's, it, it's uh, got the best, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's a good place to get tacos because they don't sell flour tortillas. I went down there and I asked for flour tortillas. They're like, get out of here. You're a white guy. We don't sell flour tortillas here. This is, <laughs> these are real Mexican restaurants. Um, but Cass and Collins is a 12 unit building there. It's an off market building. If you email me, um, the um, Hispanic population in Joliet has completely revitalized that area. It looks awesome. And it's a very, very thriving little area of Joliet, right um, to, the, um, to the east of downtown Joliet. There's a 12-unit building, not on the market. If you email me, I can connect you with the person who has that. Um, it is a property that is uh, a pocket listing by an investor, uh, by a uh, realtor that I have that has not gone live, but it was a, um, an estate um, where the person died and they, it's going through probate um, in my office actually, and it's a 12 unit building. So this is the kind of stuff where you need to align yourself with the right people. Um, I want you to, uh, how much time do we have, Hugo? We have all the time of the world. Where you were providing uh, Gary's priceless. So we're here to listen, to learn from, from the experts like you. Okay. 
Okay, well, it's 152. I'm going to blabber on for another 10 minutes or so. Um, so here's what I want you to consider. Um, when you're interviewing title companies, um, people like Hugo on whether you want to uh, become a member of Deal Vault, Gary Davidson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want you to think bigger. And I want, to th I want you to think about what value they can bring to you. And then you need to ask for it and you need to hold that person accountable. What I mean by that is I talk, a lot of times realtors will, will say, um, hey, you know, will you, will you buy my office Subway? Will you, you know, will you donate, will you, will you, will you sponsor our, you know, meeting for $150? And of course, I'm happy to do those things. But I have to laugh because I have several divorce attorneys. I have probate attorneys. I've got 16 or 17 attorneys that work for me. And we have leads. So, a lot of times the realtors that say, hey, I need, you know, Keller Williams is famous for this and I love Keller Williams. It's like, I'm, I have a MAPS coach and I've participated in bold Keller Williams. I love Keller Williams, but Keller Williams is famous for this. They, you know, they want you to pay for all their stuff. $1,000 for this, $1,000 for that, $1,000 for this. Well, guys, just remember, when you're talking to your business partners, what do you want? Do you want discounts? Do you want them to pay for your, um, your advertising or do you want leads? Because what I tell people is I don't care. I'm here to support you, right? You know, I'll, I'll support your meetings and I'll, you know, advertise with you and, and, uh, you know, but, but what I'm not, you know, or I'll give you discounts. You want the cheapest price? No problem. Um, but you have to decide what it is you want because if I'm giving you all these discounts and I'm paying for your stuff, I'm not giving you my leads because I only have so many leads. Where am I going to give my leads to? The people who pay me the most, right? So, so again, my point is not to pay people a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. My point is that people only have so much to give. So when you're interviewing your contractors, your home inspectors, figure out what it is that they, the biggest value that they can provide to you. I used to run political campaigns. I worked for the Bush, first Bush administration. You guys probably could have figured that out by my comment earlier about Illinois politics. And um, when I worked in the first Bush administration um, and we were out meeting with people, we would find out, are they big commercial property owners? And they have great locations for four by four signs because they own all these strategic corners. So then we would ask that person, hey, can, are you willing to give me 20 locations in the Chicago area where we can put up billboards? Another person has the ability to give money. Another person has the ability to make connections, right? So when you're working on people and you're building those relationships, figure out what it is that's going to be best for you to take advantage of me and to take advantage of Hugo. And when I say take advantage, what I mean is obviously to help you grow and scale your business. Um, okay. Um, hold on one sec. <clears throat> we have some background noise. I think my wife's mad at me. She's running the vacuum cleaner. Um, okay. Uh, can you speak on property tax increases? Um, you should be appealing your taxes every year. So find yourself a good um, person who does tax appeals. Hugo might, might be able to recommend some people for you. I'm sure that uh, uh, Hugo and his wife uh, appeal their taxes. So check with, with Hugo on that. Obviously taxes are gonna continue to increase. Um, we live in Illinois. Um, the Um, John, on Senate Bill 1780 um, and 1290, um, I'm not familiar with those specific bills. I might be familiar with the, the law, 
Um, if you want to um, type in exactly which one that refers to, I'm not, I, I don't keep track of the numbers, so I'm sorry, I don't know that, but if you tell me what specifically that is, it might jog my memory. Um, downturn needs to be worked into numbers, business plan for a given property. Yes, Kevin, that's true. Um, John, how will property taxes be affected by this economic situation in Illinois? They won't be. <coughs> now, here's the inside secret on that, John, is um, almost all your assessors do a five-year rolling average, okay? So you can say, hey, my property went down or there's this massive, um, uh, massive problem, but they're going to say that they're basing it on over a three or four year rolling period, uh, and even as far back as five years. Um, uh, and um, 12 unit. Christine, uh, if you uh, email G Davidson at castlelaw.com, and for all of you, uh, if you email me, um, do not text me, do not send me a message on Facebook, if you want the information on the 12 unit, you have to email me, gdavidson at castlelaw.com. gdavidson at castlelaw.com. I'll connect you with that person. Um, um, so, um, okay, that's immigration tenant protection, can't check status, and on 1780, can't discriminate arrest and jury record or expunge or sealed records. And your original request, uh, uh, Original question was, um, yeah, John, I'm not sure how that immigrant tenant protection, the question that John had was, um, and I didn't, I actually, I wasn't um, aware of this, um, that apparently under that um, act, I don't know if it's been passed yet, um, you're not allowed to check the immigration status of a tenant. Um, and then on, under 1780, you can't discriminate based on the arrest and juvenile record or expunged or sealed records. Um, so, um, I mean, obviously, um, you know, all of those things are factors and some people, it's part of their decision-making process. I mean, I guess some people, uh, like uh, undocumented uh, aliens because they always pay cash. <laughs> you know, it, depends. it depends. on the, it depends on you. Um, okay, so it's passed to one two twenty. I don't really have an opinion on that one, John. Um, should investors be more cautious in this current economic environment in comparison to a twenty oh eight downturn? Um, you know what? I don't know if it's more. Johnny asks if investors should be more cautious in the current economic environment compared to 2008. Um, one of the concerns about this particular situation is in order to make decisions, you know, for my business, 50 employees, when I'm making decisions, I'm taking data from past experiences, whether it be with clients, whether it be with circumstances, whether it be with whatever. The best predictor of the future is the past. And one of the problems with this COVID is nobody knows. If we flip the news channel, um, you know, 20 different people will give you 20 different opinions. So insofar as that's concerned, I always operate under the premise to operate an extremely successful business. We need to minimize risk and maximize return. And the way we minimize risk is we control our variables, right? Why is McDonald's the most successful company in the world um, or one of the most successful? Because it doesn't matter if you're in San Francisco or Beijing or Frankfurt, Germany, or where I'm sitting right now, Homer Glen, Illinois, the French fries taste virtually the same. 
The hamburger takes, tastes virtually the same. They train their employees exactly the same. The hamburger's fried exactly the same. And why do restaurants go out of business? Because one time we go there and it's great, and the next time it's bad. So we can control variables that helps us predict things. So I would say that um, being more cautious now, perhaps, because we're not sure. I mean, when, when the last economic downturn occurred, we knew that it was based on economic conditions. We could look back at those economic conditions, but the reality is we don't know whether this is going to be a U, if it's going to be a V, or if it's going to be um, a, uh, I don't know what which other one they describe, but like a, a downward slope and then it just kind of stays down for a long time and then comes comes back up. So you, not everyone understands, you kind of, you, you, you back up, a V, boom. That's what we're all hoping for is, is a V, right? And, and if it's a V, it's gonna be really good because um, again, the real estate market's not terrible. Um, again, Hugo mentioned, uh, we do more investor transactions than any other law firm in the entire Chicagoland area. Um, and we're down, we're definitely down. Uh, I'm probably down about 30%, 35% uh, overall. Uh, we typically will get on average about um, six, six and a half contracts per day in. So people send us, you know, now we're probably around three and a half. Um, so it's hard to predict. Um, we just have to keep talking to each other, keep having meetings like this, keep learning from each other. But I'm very bullish on the rental market uh, because I've seen so many people dive out and I've seen so much opportunity because people are getting nervous and needing to sell, having to sell, being required to sell at the exact same time that everyone's not buying. And my question to you is this, and I'll end it with that, um, short of any questions and Hugo wrapping up so we can all get back to mom. Um, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for every single other person who isn't buying right now to jump back in and buy? Does that seem like a logical thing? That you're gonna wait for every other person to go to the grocery store and go there at the absolute peak time? Or is it better to go when there's not quite as many people where you can get that um, box of Clorox uh, disinfectant wipes and that roll of toilet paper? When is it better to be able to find it? When people are shoving and pushing all over each other? Or is it better to buy when there's fewer people and still a lot of opportunity? That's my opinion. There's always good times for people who are smart, swift, efficient, and build strong relationships. That's all I have. Well, uh, that was incredible, incredible uh, information, Gary. I really want to thank you for your time and everyone's time, especially today, Mother's Day. So by the way, all mothers, happy Mother's Day. Uh, so I really like the anal analogy uh, that you mentioned about the pump. I, I love that. And in fact, because uh, right now people are leaving the pump, guess what? There's still more fish for everyone who still stays in the pump. Uh, so in fact, that is the reason why right now, in fact, if you look at our meetup event, we're, we're doing four webinars this coming week and then we're going to be doing between three to four webinars for the entire month of may why i want to make sure as gary said that you're like the matrix movie right when you open up your uh jacket you have all the tool set all the skill sets all the training so that you're ready to pull the trigger does that make sense 
In fact, that is why we're running the uh, boot camp at the end of May, May 31st. We have already, we already have 55 IR, RSVPs. We only take 100 people. I want to make sure that all of you attend that webinar because we're going to cover everything from wholesale, fix and flip, and rentals. I want to make sure that you have all the training, access to the technology, to the leads. And uh, not only that, but most importantly, as Gary mentioned, people. You're in the people's business. So we're going to um, make sure that you have access to all our preferred partners, including Gary, Frank, uh, and many more that we have over 80 preferred partners that you have to uh, take advantage of that relationship that we have with them uh, for you to be successful now, today. You've got to jump in the pond right now, as Gary said, right? What are we waiting for? Right now, I have instructed the whole team, the entire team, we're pushing more than ever. And you're gonna hear from us probably on a daily basis. Why? Because I wanna make sure that all of you are ready and all of you are in the pond fishing. I don't want you to leave the pond. Right now it's gonna be huge. As Gary said, in the next few months, there are gonna be a huge wave of foreclosures. Unfortunately, right? A lot of people are losing their home, but as Gary said, people still need a place to live. We want to be the problem solvers uh, for that huge uh, wave that is coming down the pipe. So I want to make sure that everyone is ready. Everyone is in the pond. We're going to be working together with, um, in this opportunity. Um, so I want to make sure that all of us stick together um, and truly help a lot of people. And in the process, we're going to benefit immensely. Gary, do you have anything to add? Well, great, great deal of gratitude, gratitude to you, Hugo. Uh, you've been a great friend. Uh, thanks for everybody for taking time out. Uh, and gratitude to every mother that's on the call. Um, we all appreciate you. And uh, thanks so much for spending a little time with me today. Hugo, you you can't hear you. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yeah, perfect. So I just want to make sure how to get to Gary's contact information on their preferred partners. Uh, click on attorney, and that's his contact information right there. Uh, Castle Law, Gary Davidson, his phone number, email. If you're interested in the 12 unit building apartment in Joliet, please, as he mentioned. Make sure that you email him. Uh, that's his website. Please connect with him. And not only with him, but also connect with the top players, okay? I want to make sure that you take this time to, to take a step back and really sharpen the saw. Uh, sh sharpening the saw is actually one of the uh, seven successful habits uh, by Stephen Covey. Sharpen the saw. This is the time for you to take a step back sharpen your saw. I want to make sure that you have all the training because you need to be ready to pull the trigger uh, by June, July. I mean, there's going to be huge opportunities. That is why we're pushing so hard. And not only that, but as Gary mentioned, there are a couple of uh, local lenders that are funding. Uh, we're going to make that list available to, to all of you. So make sure that you send us an email to support at chicagodealball.com. Uh, we have compiled a list of um, 21 or 22 asset-based lenders that are actively funding deals right now. In fact, uh, my wife and I, we currently have two properties on the contract and um, lenders are funding. So we want to make sure that you connect with them, that you get your line of credit and you are ready to pull the trigger. Um, this month, next month, I mean, we're sticking in the pond. I want to make sure that you, no one is leaving the pond. Okay. Um, are there any other questions on the line? 